Where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob Vicano. And welcome to hour two of tonight's show here in the Exxon with yours truly, Rob McConnell. And we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. And you're listening to us on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, and streamed around the world on classic1220.ca. Now, if you'd like to send me an email, Exxon Nation, if you have a guest you'd like us to bring on, or else maybe you've got a comment to make about a show we did, my email address is xzone, that's x-z-o-n-e at classic1220.ca, xzone at classic1220.ca. And if you're a member of the Xzone Nation, or if you'd like to become a member of the Xzone Nation, we have some great things for you on the site that we did just for this show on Classic 1220. It's Xzone on, uh, Xzone Radio on Classic 1220. That's X Zone Radio on classic1220.ca. Visit the site, sign up to become a member of the XO Nation, and we, you are going to be able to get a great number of things that non members don't get because with the X Zone membership has its advantages. And of course, we want everybody to be a member. There's no charge, there's no fee. You just get to get information that people who aren't members get. Plain and simple and to the point. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Oberon Zell. He is a renowned wizard and elder in the global magical community. In 1967, he was first to claim the identity of pagan, incorporating the first pagan church of all worlds in 1968. Uh, publishing Green Egg magazine over more than 50 years, he has been instrumental in the coalescence of the modern pagan movement and let me see, movement in uh, 1970, he published the earliest version of the Gaia Theses. In the 1980s, Oberon and his wife Morning Glory resurrected authentic living unicorns. This is true. This man actually has a unicorn. And we're going to talk to you, uh, tell you more about that on the other uh, uh, on the other side of a segment because we want to talk to Oberon this uh, this uh, in this segment. And Oberon Zell, welcome back to the Exxon, my friend. How are you? I'm good, Rob. Thanks. It's good to be back here with you. Uh, for our listeners who may not know who you are, and tell us more than that, just a little bit of information I used as a teaser to get them all wondering, who is this guy who has unicorns? <laughs> well, that, that was a pretty good little teaser there. You, you covered lots of the basics. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the Unicorn Project was way back in the 1980s, and... Eventually, they all got old and died of old age, but um, my life has continued with other things, mostly writing books in the past few years, and um, I founded a school, a school of wizardry, the Gray School of Wizardry, which I'm very proud of. It's been going on for 20 years now, and um, uh, and I just keep on writing books right now, and I'm very pleased that you have, in fact, written the foreword to my latest book which I'm very excited about, the history's mysteries. Well, the pleasure was all mine, Oberon. <laughs> but let's let's start at the basics. What is okay. a wizard? Well, uh, the word literally means, it literally means wise one, is what the word means. And wizards have been known throughout history in all cultures um, by sometimes different names. Um, since the word wizardry means wisdom, essentially, um, in ancient Greece, they were called philosophers, which means lovers of wisdom. Mm -hmm. in, the, um, uh, in the 19th century, scientists were called natural philosophers, which means um, lovers of 
the wisdom of nature, and so on. It permeates out through it. So there's more of a record of wizards throughout history than any other profession, in fact. Um, even even more documented than the uh, rather notorious ladies of negotiable affection that are often referred to as the oldest profession. But the earliest wizards were shamans, really, of the of the tribe in the village, those that people came to consult. Mm. And that's kind of what makes a wizard. P people come and consult. They ask for advice and they ask for counsel. And, and practically speaking, the wizards have been the teachers, the mentors of the next generation, and probably the best analog in modern times is professor. So that's a little bit about it. Many famous people, people know, I mean, not just Merlin and uh, Gandalf and Obi-Wan Kenobi, but people like um, Leonardo da Vinci and, um, uh, you know, famous people. Mm -hmm. The very first wizard we have a good record of, in fact, was Imhotep in ancient Egypt. And his memory is more known as the, um, the living mummy in the mummy movies, but he really was a real wizard who served four pharaohs during his time. And he designed and built the very first pyramid in ancient Egypt. So it's a good heritage. So what kind of magic do wizards do? Well, uh, wizardry tends to go with the bigger stuff, you know. Uh, witches go for things like healing and divination and spells and stuff. But wizards tend to look at the larger projects of um, changing the world, making the world a better place, uh, counseling on great subjects, um, oracular kinds of things, um, making a difference. Uh, the bigger the difference, the better. That's kind of what it's all about. And I've certainly done my share of that in time, starting a couple of movements and, and working with them and, you know, bringing unicorns back into the world and writing books. And that's the kind of stuff wizards tend to do. And being a teacher, having a school, all of that, that's wizardry stuff. Now, uh, am I, do I understand that there are no more of your unicorns anywhere? They've all passed? They've all passed. Uh, the longest ones lived about uh, 15 years. And um, since they were born in the early 80s, uh, by the late 90s, there were no more still left alive. And I had we had moved away from the country where we lived on a homesteading community that gave us the facilities necessary to raise the unicorns. And we moved away from that. And... Um, we really haven't been able to do any more. And then my wife died a few years ago. Well, going on 10 years now. And it just hasn't been a part of my life since then. But we really did it up a treat at the time. Our unicorns traveled throughout the world with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus and became quite famous of the stars of the greatest show on earth. It was a pretty big deal back in the 80s. Amazing thing is that these days, 40 some years later, the world seems to have completely forgotten that living unicorns will actually walk the earth. And maybe that's happened before. Hmm. I think it has. I, I would imagine that most people thought that there was a gimmick to your to your unicorns and, not, and that they weren't real, but they were, in fact, real. They were. They yeah. were real. We rediscovered the um, ancient secret process by which unicorns were, in fact, created. It was a, um, an art form. Um, they were not natural creatures. If they had been, they would, you know, they wouldn't appear and disappear. Mm -hmm. They've always been considered magical creatures, and they were developed by a process that enabled um, pretty much any horned animal to become a unicorn and become just a whole different creature. You know, more intelligent, more powerful, more charismatic, and uh, well, pretty much everything in the myths and stories. They really were amazing mythical creatures. Fascinating, truly fascinating. Um, Oberon, what is the Gray School of Wizardry? Well, I'm very pleased with that. Um, when I wrote my first book, <laughs> it took a long time. I was like 60 years old before I wrote my first book, and that was 20 years ago. Um, and it was a grimoire for the apprentice wizard, and I was kind of commissioned to do that due to the popularity of the Harry Potter films and stuff mm -hmm. which in books at the time. I, a publisher, New Page Books, um, asked me to write for them, and um, and they what they wanted was a uh, a textbook basically on authentic wizardry, the kind of thing that if Hogwarts had been a real school, 
uh, what would its textbook be? So I did that. I assembled a council of the greatest sages and mages and wise ones that I knew, which is pretty much all of them at that time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, and I set an assignment. I said, let's write a, a, the, a grimoire, a textbook. Uh, a grimoire means grammar, basically. It's basically like a cookbook is what we're talking about, is basic information. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be the book that you wish you could have gotten hold of when you started on the magical path and the one that you would want to get on uh, next incarnation when you come of age. You want to have this be the book you want to get. So that's the assignment. Let's do it. And so people chipped in and contributed and... Um, and I did the most of the writing and all of the editing, and but all together we put together I think a remarkable book. It's became an instant bestseller. But as I was finishing it up, um, just about this time, 20 years ago, I had this revelation that um, this is a textbook for a school that doesn't exist. So I figured, well, uh, guys, I talked to the rest of the Gray Council. Um, I think we need to start a school, <laughs> you know now. And so everybody went, okay, let's do a school. And so our first faculty and um, board of advisors was this was the great council of the uh, the wise ones of our time. And we designed and created it. Well, it was mostly my conceptual design because I had experience as a teacher. It had always been a dream for me to have a school, but I was kind of busy doing other things, having a church and raising unicorns. Yeah, little things like that, you know. Uh, but finally, it was time to do a school, so we did. And we called it the Gray School of Wizardry. And it has about 500-some classes in 16 departments and seven levels of apprenticeship. Before, and then you can go on from there. It's kind of like, oh, designed from middle school through college years, kind of a scale, Um and the, th- the funny thing about it is when I first put it together, I figured, well, this is going to appeal to the teenagers, you know, all the Harry Potter fans are going to. Mm-hmm. So we sort of gave it a starting age about that. And we were rather amazed when we opened our doors officially, our virtual doors, because it's all online, in um, at the 1st of August of 2004, that most of the people applying were adults. And they were all saying, this is what I wanted. I never could have this. But now that it's here, I'm I'm in, you know. So we immediately had to uh, adapt our programming and our curriculum for um, adults, you know, as well as uh, for the youth. So it's been quite a project. In a little over a year ago, mm-hmm. I turned over the headmastership to my protege and primary apprentice, Nicholas Kingsley. And he has been doing an amazing job ever since running the school. I'm very, very pleased. And we have a a physical campus now in Whitehall, New York, that has live classes and events and such and uh, classrooms and all. Fantastic. Yeah, it's it's really quite quite a thing. I'm I'm very very proud of the school and of the students. I, I I continue to teach, but I'm no longer running the school. I'm doing other work instead. Oberon, please stand by. We've got to take a break. And Exxon Nation, Oberon Zell is our very special guest this hour. His website is o b e r o n z e l l dot com. Oberonzell dot com. And we'll both be back on the other side talking more about wizardry and the Gray School of Wizardry as the Exxon continues with yours truly, Rob McConnell, right here on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, and streamed around the world on classic1220.ca.
This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our center in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, right here on your hometown classic, Classic Radio, Classic 1220, and streamed around the world on classic1220.ca. Oberon Zella's our guest. His website is oberonzell.com. That's Oberon Zell. And uh, Oberon, what do your students learn? What kind of things do they learn? Well, thanks, Rob. It's really quite an extensive program. Um, uh, it sort of follows the pattern of classical education, but more developed for modern stuff. So we we, we don't just teach um, magic per se, although we certainly do, but it's a larger context. We teach all the classical studies. We teach, you know, uh, languages like Latin and, and Greek. And um, we teach uh, the departments are, let me see, um, I can kind of go through them. We have, uh, they're all color coded, you see, so it makes it really easy. We have the Department of Wizardry, which kind of starts it all off, and that has to deal with historical information and um, cross cultural stuff, comparative religion, all those studies are in that. And then we have a Department of uh, Psychic Arts, which covers all kinds of psychic stuff um, and, and practices and experience in all those. We have a Department of Healing, uh, which deals with the healing uh, arts in general, of all, whatever that may be, all medicinal stuff, anatomy, healing, traditional healing, crystal therapy, wow. all of that. We have a Department of um, Wart Cunning, which is herbalism, mm -hmm. and it's pretty extensive. It covers everything from gardening to herbal tinctures and treatments. We have a Department of um, Divination. That's all forms of of divination, uh, learning the mysterious stuff, the future, unknown things, the different forms of doing that. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Department of um, Magical Practice is um, is all that includes making things, making tools, making um, learning skills of various sorts that are creative skills. Because if you make the traditional magical tools, you learn the skills of woodworking and pottery and metallurgy. F you know, forging all those kind of things, and it's all it's all part of creating your collection of magical tools. See, Department of um, uh, Natural Philosophy, all aspects of nature in the context of the larger schema of Gaia, the living planet, mm -hmm. which you mentioned briefly. The Department of um, uh, Performance Magics, which is basically the stuff we think of as stage magic and illusion, mm -hmm. but also all forms of performance, um, stagecraft and theater, uh, music, so, uh, so on. Let's see, Department of Alchemy, uh, that deals with all the sciences, um, everything from medieval science up to quantum physics is all included there. So, so it's and quite a complete curriculum. It is a very complete collection curriculum, you know, beast mastery, magic, mathematics, wow. lore, um, even dark arts is all included. It's it's a very extensive, very thorough curriculum. And, and how long and does it take someone to complete the curriculum, and and to graduate as a wizard? Well, people can go at their own pace because it's all done online, and we also have a really extensive and beautiful um, auxiliary campus in Second Life which is really nice and does all kinds of other things like mm -hmm. holding gatherings of various sorts. Um, our fastest students that have come through there to graduate to journeymen have done it in two years, which is pretty impressive. But most people, uh, it's designed to be about a year per level on the average, uh, using the same um, uh, credit system that you would find in, in any school, in any college. So that's how it's basically set up. But um, it's okay to your own pace. You can take longer or shorter, uh, depending on how much time you want to spend working on your lessons. What are your future plans for the Gray School, Wilberon? Well, we're certainly interested in expanding our physical campus and eventually opening up other physical facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at doing more uh, video work um, in it. 
uh, we're developing more of our classes are being conducted in uh, online in Zoom type of stuff or Skype or video. Right. So live classes as well. Just continuing to expand in all dimensions. It's like the online world is a magical world itself. It is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I understand that you are the founder of Modern Paganism. Yes. Now, what, I, is, mo what is Modern Paganism? Well, Paganism, of course, is, um, I mean, religious concepts throughout history have been divided into largely two major categories. The um, Abrahamic, Abrahamic traditions, which are monotheistic, and then all the rest of them, and all the pagans, which tend to be polytheistic. And these, this is the ancient ancestral religions of all humanity, of all cultures everywhere. And um, they, you know, they, t they all tend to be nature based. And so there, there's a lot of variety. It covers everything from ancient Greek and Egyptian to Vikings and Druids mm. and so on in the larger category of pagan, but all devoted to several core principles of uh, that. Well, the, the, as the motto of the Gray School is, everything is alive and everything is interconnected. And, and that is the motto of the Gray School. In Latin, omnia vivant, omnia inter se connexa, to quote Cicero. So um, these are some of the principles. Uh, uh, there's a, it's, it's all about life. It's all about nature. It's um, got a lot of feminine stuff because there's not just masculine deities like god you know there's goddesses right. as well and they're very important in it starting with mother earth herself mother nature to all the various goddesses of all the pantheons and the stories it's rich in stories and lore in poetry in um, uh, all kinds of literature and there are just many many varieties the particular pagan path that i created is the church of all worlds and that was inspired initially by a science fiction novel, because science fiction is also a kind of mythology, you know. And in uh, the ancient mythology is all about past mythology, a golden age, long past, and tales of, of long dead heroes. But science fiction takes us into a visionary place of looking mm -hmm. to the future. What kind of a world might we create? What kind of a golden age might we call into being? So... I think both of these are essential. It's a balance. We need to look forward as well as backward. What is the difference between a pagan and a witch? Well, witchcraft is a is a is an aspect of paganism. Witches are the were the tribal shamans of every, every everywhere. That's just the um, Western European term. In other cultures, uh, there are other terms for the shamans. Mm -hmm. um, Anga cock and. Alaska, shaman in the Tungusic, Siberian, and, and many others in various cultures. But every tribal people, every pagan village everywhere in the world had somebody whose task was to be the, the village um, shaman. And this was the wizard or, or, or witch right. that people would come to for various things. Women would come for midwifery and, and spells and herbalism and healings and counsel and advice and so on and so on and so on, as well as... Um, well, witches didn't really do in ancient times um, religious ceremonies per se. That really wasn't it. The village was not a village of witches, you know. It was a craft. You would have your village blacksmith and your village weaver, and you'd have your village witch. You know, she would just be another craft in the village. In more modern times, starting in the 1950s, um, uh, a revival of witchcraft or a reconstruction, perhaps, is more accurate, um, has brought it into the realm of religion, largely because of protection um, of religious rights in countries mm -hmm. like the United States that guarantee freedom of religion. Right. So modern witchcraft is also a religion. It involves ceremonies and all of that kind of stuff. It, but is it's there, a part of it. It's all a part of the same larger cycle. Are paganism, witches, witchcraft, and Wicca three different entities? Well, there are different perspectives uh, that are all interlinked. I mean, paganism okay. is the overall religion overall. That's that's just the general name, and it encompasses everything. Witchcraft is a is a uh, an aspect of that. Um, Wicca is the specific religious designation. So, um, uh, most witches 
uh, will also refer to themselves as Wiccans, and when they're referring to the religion mm -hmm. specifically, then it will be Wicca. But there are witches who don't uh, consider themselves to be religious functionaries. There are people who work in occult shops and do kitchen witchery and, and herbalism, but they don't necessarily fall into the larger religious category. But Wicca is specifically the religion. Why is it that paganism is perceived by some people as something negative? Well, that's not our fault. <laughs> you know, uh, that has to do with the fact that for for um, a couple thousand years, well, at least a thousand years anyway, um, the Christian churches have done everything they can to persecute out of existence the people, everybody who wasn't them. Competition. You know, like Alex of Doctor Who, you know, they've mm -hmm. ran the witch burnings and the Inquisition yeah. and um, all that. So we've become vilified, not because of anything we did, but because of uh, being competitors, I guess, on a scale of, of monotheism doesn't play well with others. It doesn't have room for anybody else, you know. Nobody ever taught it how to play nice in the sandbox. Precisely, precisely. And this is a lesson I think we all need to assimilate at mm -hmm. this time. We cannot continue that way with all these different groups claiming to be the one true right and only way. You know, there's over 400 sects of Christianity, and all of them consider all the others to be heresies. I mean, that's madness, you know. Yeah, when you've got the one to right and only way, everybody else is wrong. And if everybody else is wrong, then they're bad. And if they're bad, then they should be punished. And so on it goes. And we, we see what's going on right now in Israel and That's Palestine. Right, yeah. It's a holy war. You know, it all depends on how much money you have because money equals marketing. Marketing equals power. Yep, that's exactly right. It's, it's all about the power thing. And that's not what it should be about. No, I, I agree mean, with you. The word religion means relinking. It's what's supposed to be able to connect us with each other and bring us together. And the teachers and prophets of the various religions, including Jesus and Buddha and mm -hmm. all of that, you know, that's what they taught. They taught people they should love each other. You know, none of this... None of this trying to kill other people for heresy and burning people at the stake. Jesus never told people to do that, you know. No, it's all a matter of control. Yep, it is. You and I have to take our break uh, for now at the bottom of the hour. Please stand by Oberon. And our guest this hour, Exonation, is Oberon Zell. His website is OberonZell.com. That's O-B-E-R-O-N-Z-E-L-L.com. And he is the founder of the Gray School of Wizardry. You're probably thinking, wow, wizards really do exist. Not only Merlin, not only Mickey Mouse as the wizard's <laughs> apprentice, but really. And this wizard actually had unicorns. Yep. See, this is why I say fact is stranger than fiction, Exxon Nation. And Oberon and I will be back on the other side of this very short break as we continue here in the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell, from our studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, right here on Classic 1220 and streaming around the world on Classic1220.ca. Don't go away. Back to the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell, and you're listening to us on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, and streamed around the world on Classic1220.ca. And uh, the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. until midnight, right here. Where? Oh, come on. You should know this by now. Classic 1220 is streamed on Classic1220.ca. Oberon Zell is my special guest. OberonZell.com is his website. 
And um, Oberon, I understand that you're the founder of uh, Paganism, which we talked about. Uh, but tell us about the 60-year cultural renaissance cycle. Oh, yeah, I'm delighted to because uh, we have just um, entered into the latest one of those. And in, in my studies in research and history, which have been extensive and and culminating in the current book, mm -hmm. um, I, I noticed that there was uh, a cycle that every 60 years there was a cultural renaissance. And it started in the 1480s with the Italian Renaissance. And then 40 years later was the Reformation and the Age of Discovery and all kinds of stuff revolved around that. And then um, in uh, around 1600s, it was the English Renaissance, what they called the Golden Age. Right. And then the 1660s was the Scientific Revolution and all the famous um, scientists at that time, Newton and Galileo and Copernicus and all that. And um, then in, let's see, the, it was the 1660s, the 1720s was the Great Awakening, a, a major... Uh, cultural event. Mm -hmm. And then the 1780s was what they call the Age of Reason. The American and French revolutions occurred during that period. And then the 1840s was the Transcendentalist Awakening uh, with, you know, all the great poets and writers and artists, uh, Whitman and Thoreau and all those guys. Then at the turn of the uh, 20th century, we had uh, the um, Golden Dawn the beginning of all the magical lodges and all of those associations. And then the 1960s, the New Age, as, as it came to be known, was certainly one of those. And it was loaded with every kind of imaginable revolution going on of all levels of civil rights and, and the feminist movement and the gay rights movement and, the, well, the pagan movement, too. Environmentalism, all these things. These, move, these times tend to spurn revolutions that transform the world. So I became aware of this about 20 years ago, and I said, well, uh, the next one of these is going to be in the 2020s. And given the, the way these things flow, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to designate it the Awakening. And so it is. And here we are in the 2020s. And it started right off the bat with the COVID um, experience, the mm -hmm. years the world stood still. And... Um, and we're already seeing major transformations of stuff that is being referred to as awakening and wokeness and all of this stuff. So, so far I'm on a roll with this. Um, so I project the next one in the 2080s. Well, I'm calling it the diaspora, the time when we actually start leaving the earth and, and beginning to establish uh, bases and colonies um, outside of the earth. So... That's my projections, and that's what I've, I've discovered. And then there's a lot more on this. I mean, you just look up some of these periods of time and see what amazing things happen during them. It's fascinating. I have to ask you about something. I learned that you have gone diving for mermaids. Tell me about yeah. this. Well, after, after we made the um, lease agreement with the Ringling Brothers Circus, we got mm -hmm. some money out of that, and we kind of decided, well, what are we going to do next? And right about that time, this was 1984, there was um, a lot of stuff going on about uh, sightings of mermaids in off an island off of New Guinea called New Ireland. And there was an ethnologist um, who was doing some research there on the terms for different kinds of creatures and trying to distinguish between those that were real animals versus mythological and the people talked to him about these creatures they called Ilkai or Re. And he asked them, well, are these mythological creatures or are they real animals? He said, no, this is a real animal. Uh, come on down to the beach and, and, at dusk and we'll show you one. And so he went on down and at dusk, the, this creature appeared in the bay. They, they could see not, couldn't see it very clearly. It was way out there. It was dusk. But they could see this beautiful tail that waved up above the water shaped like a whale tail, only much smaller, of course, mm -hmm. and disappearing down. And then they would see kind of a head and shoulders bobbing up in shadow. And after very brief appearances, mostly it was underwater, but it came, came up enough. And he was pretty amazed. So he wrote a report in the International Society of Cryptozoology journal, which we subscribed to because um, our unicorns had brought us into a certain amount of attention. And I'd also done some other research work in 
you know, with Bigfoot and stuff like that, just investigating mysteries. I was writing a book, actually. That was the way this all started off. We were planning on doing research for a book on um, legendary and mythical creatures, which we eventually did write. And it's um, called A Wizard's Bestiary. And I, I recommend it because it's a pretty cool book. It's got like 1,500 illustrations of over 1,000 critters. And it was during the process of all that that we just came upon the secret of the unicorn and that kind of diverted us. So there we are. And we figured, well, okay, let, what next? Um, let's mount a diving expedition and underwater photography and go check out these mermaid stories. So we did. We assembled a team of 13 people. We all took divers lessons and got certified and got an underwater video team that had done a movie called The Deep. And we went off to New Guinea and got a dive boat. And, um, uh, it was quite an adventure, and we eventually did, in fact, uh, discover the secret of the mermaids, which was not quite what we hoped we would find. We were looking for something that was maybe aquatic apes that had continued to evolve for millions more years and become more sea creatures with following the same path that dolphins and seals and mm -hmm. sea otters had of becoming aquatic. I still believe that our human ancestry owes a considerable part of its heritage to um, an aquatic period. But that was not what we found. What we found was a type of Cyrenian uh, called dugongs that are very rare, very endangered, and their behavior was not very well known. People think of Cyrenians as manatees, like which are you know, fat and slow and ungainly and right, freshwater yeah. critters in Florida. But these are not like that. It's like comparing a walrus to a California sea lion. Hmm. You know, these are sleek and oceanic creatures and, and really quite spectacular with these beautiful, beautiful tails. And they have breasts like a human woman has. And that's why they were called the fish women. Uh, Pishmary is the pigeon name or sea women, or mermaid, which means the same thing, sea woman. And that's the story. Uh, we found this all out. We, um, While we were there, unfortunately, we experienced the death of one of these because a little Japanese tugboat came into the bay while we were there. And um, uh, we were on shore with the natives having a sing-sing, but they came in to haul away the big raft of logs that they had been uh, cutting down in the area. That's another whole story. And the next morning, the, the tugboat was gone. They had, did not take the raft of logs, and there was a dead um, ilkai on the beach. Oh, no. It was really tragic. So we went in. We filmed all this, and um, you can see some of the footage in a documentary film that was made about me, the unicorns, the mermaids, called The Wizard Oz. And there's a link to it on my website. So if you want to get the whole story and see the video, there it is. When was the first sighting of a mermaid, and where was it? Was the sighting made in the proximity where you were actually doing this uh, this research? Yeah, apparently the sightings and the legends all the way back um, come out of Indonesia, which wow. is the it was the habitat of these creatures. As sailors, um, European sailors started traveling in those waters, a mm -hmm. lot of things came out of that time. The uh, the stories of the dragons that that came from the um, Komodo Islands, the stories of the flying dragons, the little flying lizards that are in various places in Indonesia, the stories of the giant birds, the rocks came from Madagascar. So it, mostly it was early Dutch sailors in the beginning, but everybody got in on the act eventually. And they would come back with these stories of things that they had seen. And of course, there was no photography no. and they didn't have artists on the board. So they would describe what they saw and people would draw pictures according to the descriptions. And that's where we get all these fantastic pictures of, of, you know, everything from mermaids to the giant rocks to dragons and all kinds of stuff. You talked briefly about Bigfoot. What did yeah. you find out or what have you, what have, what did your research, where did your research take you as well? Well, mostly the Pacific Northwest. And I, I um, didn't really do that much field research. Mm -hmm. I mostly ended up going to various Bigfoot centers and talking to the people who were, <coughs> pardon me, the researchers and investigators. I studied the specimens of various sorts that they had and had mm -hmm. lots of discussions with them. Um, 
it's an interesting phenomenon. In fact, just a few weeks ago, uh, well, I guess it's been a couple of months now, I attended a Bigfoot um, festival in here in North, in North Carolina, or actually South Carolina. And um, we ended up staying in at a lodge with some of the researchers who make the shows, the TV shows mm -hmm. on searching for Bigfoot. We had quite some discussions. I personally feel that the evidence supports the idea of there being a survival um, of the um, one of the uh, paranthropoid type beings that were in early human evolution. There were a lot of different hominids that we weren't the only one. We're the only one officially that survived. We tend to have killed off all the others, but the habitat that is assigned to these creatures is the largest natural habitat on the planet and largely uninhabited. And that's the taiga, the, the great uh, uh, boreal forest that encompasses, you know, the entire circles of the North Pole uh, from Canada on up mm -hmm. around the world. And that's a big territory. Sure you know, is. And a lot of things can be there. So I'm, I'm, I, I think of them as the most possible, most likely of the yet unconfirmed cryptids. But um, there are also weird reports, especially in this area down here in the Appalachians, that don't seem to correlate with the Pacific Northwest Bigfoot. They, they seem to be more supernatural, and they're associated with UFO sightings. And I don't know what to make of that. I really don't. It's, it gets off into the weird area that, um, who knows, who knows. There's probably stuff going on we have no idea about there. You know, we're talking about the boreal forest, uh, how big, how, how, how deep it is, how unexplored it is, yeah. where, where Bigfoot could actually live and go unnoticed, as well as other creatures that I'm sure we have yet to discover. But we can also say the same thing about the depths of our oceans, because our we oceans can. are so big, and, and yet we'd rather go to the moon than do an investigation right at our own front door. You and I have to take our final break, my good friend, so please stand by. Exonation, our guest this hour is a good friend of mine, Oberon Zell. His website is oberonzell.com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and we come to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until midnight. Monday through Friday, right here on Classic 1220, and streamed around the world on classic1220.ca. Whether you're a skeptic or you're a believer, send me your email. Tell me what you think. Xzone at Xzone. I'm sorry, Xzone at. See, we changed so many times. It's Xzone at classic1220.ca. Mind you, if you send me an email to Xzone at XzoneRadioTV.com, I'll still get it. But this way here, we know it comes from our listening family who listen to us faithfully from our studios here in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, and streaming on classic1220.ca. We'll be back as we wrap up tonight's show here in the X-Zone. Don't go away. And welcome back, everyone. By the way, if you're wondering where we're getting the music from tonight, using them as bumpers in and out of each segment, they're from an album called The Music of the X-Zone, and it's available on Amazon. And uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cuts. First one is Blue Canadian Skies. Second cut is Laura's Theme. Third is Mayan Prophecy. Fourth is Rented Silence, followed by Rise Above, Hate and Anger, then followed by Robbie Shuffle, The Genesis Grid, and the one that we just played was called UFO Concerto. And actually, when I was watching 
uh, close encounters of the third kind. Remember that scene where the big mothership comes over at Devil's Peak? Well, I decided that I'd spruce something up, so I wrote that overnight, and uh, there you go. That's the history behind UFO Concerto and the music we've been playing tonight here on the X-Zone. Oberon Zell is my guest. Oberonzell.com is his website. Uh, Oberon, um, going through the list of books that you've done, one jumped out at me, and I'd like to talk to you about it. Prophecy and the End of the World as We Know It. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good start there. Um, I actually ended up incorporating uh, much of the information I had set aside for that book, um, uh, or had, had used in it, in a couple of the chapters in the Histories Mysteries book. And this was originally written as we were coming right up to the 2012 um, occasion of the, the fulfillment of the Mayan calendar prophecies. Right. And so I, I um, worked with Harvey Wasserman, who was kind of a joint project of us, to put together a, a book that addressed that. And he had a lot of contributions for it as well, visioning a, a futuristic solar topia vision. And um, there's a lot of good stuff in the book. My contributions largely had to do with um, specifics relating to uh, prophecies of the end of the world and the Mayan prophecies specifically. And the Mayan prophecies did not say anything about the end of the world. Nope. It's the end of the calendar. Exactly. Yeah. So, but the interesting thing about it is <clears throat> we have a calendar that is the large calendar of the 26,000 year total cycle of the precession of the equinoxes through all 12 signs of the zodiac. And if that sounds too complicated, um, uh, your listeners can read it in my book because <laughs> it explains it. But, but um, every uh, couple thousand years, the shifting of the axis of the earth carries us through another one of the signs, which is we why I talk about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius and right. so on. And um, But all of these, there's 12 of them, comprise a total of 26,000 years. And the question about that, uh, which is interesting, how do you know when the transition is? You have to know when the starting point is. And it's like we have a calendar. I mean, we have a, a clock face. Imagine a clock face. Mm -hmm. Well, midnight is the setting point, you know, for it. So all the all the times go from 12 on around, you know, and so we have a starting point for the year. We have a starting point, which is New Year's, which is traditionally was winter solstice, which was last week. But um, but we still have a New Year's. We have a starting point and you have to know what the starting point is in order to get the whole thing. Well, the Mayans figured that out brilliantly and they figured that the starting point of the entire cycle was when the. Um, winter solstice sunrise occurred right over the center of the galaxy, which only happens once every 26,000 years. And um, it happened to occur in winter solstice of 2012. And so that would be the starting point. And the starting point on the great cycle of this is in fact Aquarius. Um, and the last time we went into the age of Aquarius, 26,000 years ago, is the period we call the creative explosion, when human culture just exploded into art and cave paintings and, and sculptures of little goddess figures and, and just all kinds of innovations that occurred then. There's whole books about the creative explosion, and that was the last age of Aquarius. So here we are turning into another one, and... Um, I think I, I find it very convincing that the Mayans who were astonishing astronomers, just down to amazing details mm -hmm. of the movements of the stars and planets, um, had it right with that. That makes perfect sense that that's the starting point of the entire 26,000 year cycle. So that's basically the gist of it. My wife and I went down to uh, the Yucatan and into the Mayan uh, villages and we spoke with the Mayan elders and they thought that this, you know, the, that we were just a little bit off the raw wall when we were talking about the end of the world. They said, one, one of the elders, great guy, said, let me put it in a way that maybe you will understand. You know, at home you have a fridge with most people have calendars on them. Right. Said, yeah. He said, what do you do on December 31st? Right. Well, we put up a new calendar. He said, well, there you've got it. There you go. Exactly. And that point is, at that point, though, 
you can choose what kind of a calendar you can put, you want to put up. Mm-hmm. What's going to be the theme? What kind yep. of pictures you want to have? It's a new, it's a pivotal time. It's a beginning time to put up the new calendar. So here we are. Yeah. Um, good. Where do you think the Mayans got their great gift of for astrology and astronomy? They were really? so dead on. They were amazingly so. Their observations of uh, of the planet Venus, in particular, they deified the planets much as ancient peoples did other places in the world. The Babylonians were pretty good at their astronomy as well with that, and have hugely detailed records. But um, but the Mayans had a a focus on their numerical system. They had a way of counting that is very different than what we do. They counted in terms of twenties, you know, and um, interlaced them with. 20s and 7s in a very complicated fashion that allowed them to just pinpoint cycles really, really well with that. And their obsession with this had to do with their concept of life cycles. They believed that at these transitional times, like this one, that souls would transit from this realm into the the other realm of Mm -hmm. Jabalba. And so it was very important to know exactly when these moments of transition were, like the uh, like the people who built Stonehenge, which was important to be able to know when the solstices and equinoxes occurred and stuff like that. And so this this mattered with their cosmology and their theology to be able to pinpoint this information. And they were totally obsessed. Also, they had observatories. You know, I visited um, some observatories when I was down in Guatemala. Um, there's one in particularly very well preserved, one in Chichen Itza mm-hmm. that... Um, I, I think, I suspect that these observatories housed um, an early form of camera obscura that allowed them to uh, magnify observations from a, a mirror to a lens to a large circular reflective surface. And these look, you know, they, the observatories of the Mayans look to me exactly like the um, uh, camera obscuras that we have in various places around the world. So I think that we're able to see stuff that we can't normally see. When they didn't have telescopes, they had these things instead. Anyway, that's some of my thought. But I, yeah, I went down there, too, and I was really fascinated. I, I even did some cave diving in some of the uh, caves in the Shinotes to get a sense of the underworld of Jabalba that is actually the cave system under, under um, the Yucatan. Before we stuff. before we say so long, I have to ask you about your new book that's coming out, Histories, Mysteries. Yes. Tell us about it. Well, I have I've always been fascinated by this kind of stuff, mystery things. You know, the unicorns and yeah. Bigfoot is in the animal realm, but I've also been fascinated by strange little turns of fate that have occurred throughout history. Things that, in which had things gone slightly differently, we'd be in a very different world than we are today. And in other interesting episodes and things that happen that we've largely forgotten about because they just don't fit into our normal concepts of history, you know, which is about wars and reigns of of emperors and so on. Right. But these are the interesting stories. And I've kind of collected these over the years and I've given lectures on them and written articles about them because I find them fascinating. And finally, it got to the point where I said, you know, I've got all these all these uh, workshops and presentations and editorials and stuff on this subject and time to write a book for it. So that's usually the way my books come up together. I start by just collecting stories or interesting tidbits. And eventually when I get enough of them, I've got a book <laughs> and that's kind of how this one came together. So it's all finished now. I'm uh, the only thing left is the indexing, which is in process at the moment. And I'm very excited. So when do you think that this new book will be available to the public? Within a couple of weeks, I believe. Wow. Um, my publisher is very eager to have it out in early January as the first offering of the new year for them. So um, that's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm hoping I'll be able to finish the indexing within the next few days, certainly, and then send it off there. And uh, within a couple of weeks, it should be available. Well, let us know when it's available, and we'll certainly let our listeners know where and how they can get it. You bet. And I, again, I thank you for writing a forward for it. I think that is the perfect contribution, and you're the right one to do it. Thank you so much. Your kind words mean a lot to me, my friend. 
What are your final thoughts or words of wisdom for the listening audience of the XO Nation here on Classic 1220? Well, you know, I, I really love the whole idea of this, uh, exploring the unknown. Uh, it's like the most interesting parts of maps, and I love maps, are the part that's um, the unknown territory that says, here there may be dragons, you know. <laughs> And, and that's what I love to explore. And I think the show does that. You know, you're exploring that that territory off the map. Yeah. And, and that's where it gets really interesting. So I suspect that your listeners would not be your listeners were they not also interested in these little territories off the map. And so I can only encourage people to keep on exploring. And all of my books are available on Amazon. Go look me up. I'll plug Amazon, my name into Amazon and you can see some of the books I've already written on various subjects and I have a number more in mind and in process um, because this is fun. It's fun to explore these unknown realms and territories. This is what we do as humans. We explore the unknown. Well, that's what we should do as humans instead of fight each other, cause wars. Oh, yes, you know, and, absolutely. And, and ruin the, know there's, ruin there's the environment. So to discover and, out yeah. there. Why in the world are we fighting with each other? It's just stupid. I think that the term holy war is an oxymoron myself. <laughs> you know? Just like postal service, military yes. intelligence. <laughs> right. And the list goes, you know, yeah. um, m marijuana initiative. <laughs> <laughs> There's oh, a lot of those. Oh, Baron, as always, time goes by so fast when you're, when you're with us here in the Exxon. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Continued success. And uh, let us know when your book is out there, and we'll certainly get the word out for you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rob. I'm always delighted to be on your show. Take care of yourself, my good friend. Good night and happy new year. Thank you to you too as well, my friend. Exo Nation, Oberon Zell has been my guest this hour. And if you'd like to find out more about Oberon, visit him online at oberonzell.com. And his many books are available on Amazon. All you need to do is in the search engine, type in Oberon. That's O-B-E-R-O-N Zell, Z-E-L-L. -L. Well, that's it for tonight and this week. I'll be back Monday as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the X-Zone. So, until next we meet my friends and my producer just said no. Our next show is on Tuesday, which is tomorrow. So, until tomorrow, New Year's, it throws me off all the time. So, until tomorrow, my friends, at 10 o'clock, remember... Always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. From everyone here on the x to everyone out there listening to us on your hometown radio, Classic 1220, good night, take care, and be safe.